How's that? Maybe I won't lose my voice quite so quickly now. As I was saying, it's, uh, it's good to be here tonight and it's good to have this opportunity for, for me to speak to you. I appreciate that opportunity. I appreciate the songs that um, James led for us uh, this evening. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed, but all of the songs had uh, verses of Scripture that came from the book that we're going to look at tonight, which is 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy will be our text for this evening. And we're going to stay in 1 Timothy pretty much. We're not going to go all over the Bible. I'd just like to take the time to take some lessons from 1 Timothy. In so doing, in, in the songs that James chose tonight, he kind of hit on uh, what my lesson is about this evening. What I'd like for us to see from 1 Timothy is that there is more to be gained from it than what we might typically look at. Sometimes I think we take books like 1 Timothy and we use them as a reference to find topical um, subject matter. For instance, we might ask, where do I find the qualifications for elders and deacons? Well, we go to 1 Timothy 3. There's a list right there. How do I know whether the church can support a widow or not? Well, if we go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, there's a list there of what are widows indeed and who can be supported from our church treasury. How do we deal with false teachers? Well, chapter 1 says that they should be charged not to teach what is not sound doctrine. And so we go to that to, uh, as a commandment for how to deal with false teachers. Should I despise Wayne because he's so young? Well, chapter 4 tells us that no, we can't. As hard as it is, we shouldn't do that. And so we treat Timothy as a reference, but what I'd like to do is look at the why, <clears throat> excuse me, the why behind this letter. Why did Paul write this letter to Timothy? And you say, well, Paul didn't write the letter, the Holy Spirit did. Well then, okay, why did the Holy Spirit write the letter to Timothy? What, <laughs> is it really just a bunch of random instructions that were convenient to put in a letter and give to Timothy so that he could give to the congregation because they needed to know these things? Is it just as a bunch of random instructions or was there a reason for the writing of this letter? And in my view, every letter has a reason. Every letter has a reason for being written. Just like you sit down and you write a letter to somebody because you're thinking about them, uh, or maybe you write an email to them because you're thinking about them, or because you need to know the answer to, the que to a question, or you need to impart some information to them. There's a reason for you to do that. You don't just randomly sit down and start writing things to people because they'll hit delete as soon as they get it, if you do that. Well, the same goes for the letters that we find in the New Testament. <clears throat> And if we understand the reason behind these letters, including 1 Timothy, then we can understand much more about what is being taught there. And so I have, in my study, found three reasons, there may be more, that I believe are behind the writing of this letter. Reason one, I've already mentioned, and that is uh, that Paul is concerned about false teaching. If we look at chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, we see what Paul has to say about that. Right off the bat, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, not to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons by swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, 
<clears throat> excuse me, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So we have these men who are teaching myths concerned with endless gene genealogies, speculation, vain discussion, Paul calls it. And Timothy is charged not to teach these different doctrines. Paul had even handed two of them over to Satan, if you look up down in verses 18 through 20. This is what Timothy had to contend with, and Paul was concerned about this. These teachers of the law ironically failed to realize the purpose of the law. It was for sinners, not for the righteous. <clears throat> sinners, including themselves, who taught contrary to sound doctrine. Well, not only did he have to contend with teachers, uh, false teachers presently, but he also had to prepare for the coming teaching of demons. And turn over to chapter 4. Verses 1 through 10 of chapter 4 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received, with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. If you put these things before for the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people. People, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. So Timothy was to train himself and he was to train the brethren because not only do they have to deal with false doctrine, um, unsound doctrine, different doctrine at the time of this writing, but there was more to come and they needed to prepare. Turn also to chapter 6. <clears throat> beginning in the latter half of verse 2. And see how Paul describes these that teach unsound doctrine, different doctrine. Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment, for we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and, and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Again, T Timothy is urged to teach sound doctrine. And Paul's uncomplimentary description seems to be meant to keep Timothy and the brethren from respecting what these have to say, but to discount it completely. Paul indicates that their purpose was to find monetary gain in the faith. So this was a concern of Paul. Different doctrine coming into the church. The teaching of demons coming into the church. And Paul wants to prepare, prepare Timothy for it. So what do we learn from this? Well, we learn that different doctrine is not to be tolerated. We learn that those that teach different doctrine are to be charged not to teach it. And we are, learn that different doctrine is to be countered with the teaching of sound doctrine. Alright, so that's reason number one that I found. Reason number two 
is that Paul was concerned about how the Christians behave themselves. In chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, we find this, um, this spoken or given by Paul. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. So Paul is concerned about how they behave themselves in the household of God. What did Paul tell them? Well, in chapter 2, and in verse 1 through 8, he tells them to pray. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Besides this, if you continue reading, you see that he wanted women to be clothed with modesty and self-control. In chapter 3, he says that he wanted good men to lead the congregation. He gives those qualifications for elders and deacons. If you go to chapter 5, he said he wanted the widows to have a reputation for good works, among other things. He wanted, in chapter 6, servants to honor their masters. And then one more passage I'd like to read is uh, chapter 6, verse 17 through 19. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertain of rich, uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And so Paul wanted the rich to behave in a way where they are not trusting in their riches, but that they are trusting in good works as a foundation for the future. The treasure that they should be laying up for themselves rather than trusting in their own wealth. So, Paul was concerned about the behavior of these Christians that Timothy uh, was preaching to. So what do we learn? Well, there are standards. There are standards for how God's people must behave. And that Christians must learn those standards and follow them. And Christians must not be concerned about storing up bridges in this life, but must lay up treasure of good works. All right. So that's reason number two. Paul was concerned about the behavior of the Christians. Reason number three that I found was that Paul was concerned about his beloved young Timothy his child in the faith, as he describes him in chapter 1 and verse 2. You see, Paul left Timothy in Ephesus with a huge responsibility, especially for such a young man. And he left Timothy with a great task. In chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, he tells him to wage the good warfare. In chapter 6, he tells him to fight the good fight. He tells him in chapter 4, verses 6 through 11, to command and teach. In chapter 6, verses 2 through 10, to teach and urge. In chapter 4, he tells him to set an example. I'd like to read chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Let no one despise you for your youth, but to set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. 
until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. He was to practice and immerse himself in the teaching and to set an example for the believers. He was to treat everyone properly in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, with respect and purity. He was to handle disputes and sin in chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. He was to remain pure. Let's turn to chapter 5, verses 21 through 23. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing for partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sin of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. He was to keep himself pure in his relationship and his dealings with those around him, with the brethren. He was to use the gifts given to him. Let's turn back to chapter 1. Verses 18 through 20. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, by rejecting that some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Turn to chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth. But set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Uh, this is the verse I was, I was really trying to get to. Verse 14. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy, when the council of elders laid their hands on you. And then finally, turn to chapter 6 and verse 20. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. So Paul had many instructions for Timothy because he was concerned about Timothy because Timothy had such a great responsibility for such a young man. And Paul wanted to make sure that he was equipped and that he kept in mind all the things that he needed to be successful at his task. So what do we learn? from this. And we learn that evangelists have a hard job. But, that's, that's not nearly enough. If Timothy was to be an example to the congregation, then that means all of those to whom he was supposed to be an example should be following that example. And therefore, we should be following that example as well. While we may not be young like Timothy, some of us, we still must be diligent to remain pure. We must prepare ourselves to deal with false teaching, as Timothy did, and we must be a good example to each other and to those around us. So, those are the three reasons that I found in this book for its writing. The three things that Paul seemed to be most concerned about. There may be others. I may have missed something. You can feel free to tell me that later. And you may think that my lesson is over, but it's not. I still have 20 minutes. You see, while I have found three reasons for Paul's writing of this lesson, I have failed to answer the question, why? Why was he concerned about these things? Why did he feel it necessary to write about false doctrine? To write about how the Christian should behave? To write about how Timothy was to conduct himself and prepare himself for this difficult task that he, with which he was left? Well, the answer is because Paul wants salvation for everyone. 
Plain and simple as that. Let's examine this a little more closely. Why was Timothy charged? Why was Timothy to charge those not to teach a different doctrine? Well, it distracted from the aim. Read chapter 1 and verse 5 once again. It distracted from the aim of their charge. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. These different doctrines, this, um, how does he describe it? Speculations, myths, endless genealogies, distracted from love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. It caused dissension and it kept people from the truth. Turn again to chapter 6. Describing these teachers of different doctrines. He is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words. I'm in verse 4 right now. Which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people. And I love this description. Who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. That's what we get when we allow different doctrines into the church. We get people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Why? Because they are distracted from what is true. They are distracted from sound doctrine. And they go off and believe different doctrine. False doctrine. Unsound doctrine. It causes Christians to swerve from the faith, as it says in verses 20 through 21. The irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge had caused some to swerve from the faith. And Paul wanted Timothy to fight against these doctrines that take away salvation. That was the why. Why was Timothy told how Christians should behave? Well, turn to chapter 3. He says it very plainly. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. If Christians don't know how to behave in the church, then how can we be the pillars and buttresses of the truth? How can we be the ones that hold up the truth? Why did he want them to behave? Why did he tell them how to behave? Because in chapter 6 we read they needed to store up good works as a treasure. They needed to forget about the treasure of this life and take away their hope in that and instead store up good works as a treasure in chapter 6 verses 18 through 19 to give them a good foundation for the future. How can we support the truth if we do not behave ourselves properly? How will people know the great mystery of godliness that's described here in chapter 3 and verse 16 if our lives are not aligned with it? Let me read this again. Great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. If we're not behaving ourselves as if we believe that, if we're not living by that every day, then how can we have the foundation that we need? How can we be the pillar and buttress of the truth? How can we stand in the face of false doctrine and persecution? if we do not have a firm foundation. Paul wrote this because he did not want the Christians to falter in doing what was right 
so they could be saved and could bring others to salvation. And finally, why was Paul concerned about Timothy's purity? In chapter 5, verses 21 through 23. Why was he concerned about Timothy using the gifts that were given to him? In chapter 4 and verse 15. Why was Paul concerned that Timothy immerse himself in the teachings? In chapter 4 and verse 15. Well, if you turn to chapter 4, I wrote down the wrong verse. Ah, here, no, here it is, right here. Okay, chapter 4 and verse 11. Command to teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. Because Timothy was to be an example to the believers. So he wanted him to remain pure. He wanted him to immerse himself in the teachings. In verse 15, practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. What do you think that does when we, we see a, a young man progress and grow in the Word? Progress and immerse himself in the, in the teachings and practice them? What does that do for the believers that are around him? It encourages them. It helps them to grow as well. It helps us all to get closer to that salvation which we all hope for. This is why Paul wrote this. And that's exactly what he says in verse 16. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. So what's the point of Paul's letter? Why did he write this? Well, the main point is that he was concerned about their salvation. He wanted Timothy and all that, he, that heard him to be saved. So what do we learn? Well, as strange as it might seem, I learned from this that we are not here in this congregation to be or to become good Bible students. And we are not here in this congregation to argue about doctrine. And we are not here to make sure that our contributions are used in the right way. And we are not here to ensure the conformity of our behavior. We do all these things and they're important, but that's not why we are here. And if that's the focus of our existence, if that is why we're here, as, as Christians and as a congregation, then we've forgotten our charge. Rather, we are here to help to be saved and to help others be saved. We are here to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And in closing, I'd like to read from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. You may recall from the beginning of 1 Timothy, although I did not read it, but you may have read it on your own. But this is where Timothy was, in Ephesus, when Paul wrote this letter to him. And in Ephesians, chapter 4, and verse 11... Paul says to the Ephesians, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, 
joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That is why this congregation is here. To grow. To grow together. And build ourselves up in love. Together. I hesitate to say this because it's kind of humorous and I, I don't know. May, maybe it's too flip, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, in verse 15, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ. I just cannot help but picture, have you ever seen a baby whose head was too big? And you said, boy, I hope that baby grows into that head. Well, I kind of think of, <laughs> when I see this passage, I kind of think of us that way. We have this really big head, Jesus the Christ. And we are the body, and we are trying to grow up into that head. We're trying to be the body that that head wants us to be. And sometimes we don't do what the head tells us to do, and we stumble around, and we fall. But Christ wants us to be His body. Christ wants us to grow up into Him. And we do that in love. Well, that's my lesson for tonight. I hope that it was uh, beneficial to you. I hope that um, I hope that we all learned something from that. And especially I hope that we all learned that the reason that we are here is because we are trying to build, us, build up each other in love. We are trying to be the body that Christ wants us to be. And if you are here and you have not been a part of the body, if you have not been the example to others that you should be, then now is the time to make a decision to make a change, to start following the teaching and immersing yourself in it and preparing yourself to help others to be saved. If you're here tonight and you have not been saved and we can help you in, in, in your salvation and in, in your growing in your faith, then we'd like to help you tonight if you'll come as we stand and sing.